with some of them and I'll just talk quickly through the, the slides. And let's just uh, make me a little smaller. And let's put the, the slideshow on. So chapter two is about software processes and there are lots of different ways that you can do software. And there's some things that you really should do, but there's lots of different ways you can do those things. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Topics covered are software process models, the activities you should do, how to cope with change, and then how to improve your processes. Right, a software process, I'm not gonna read everything just like the previous one. You can read this as well as I can. But a software process is a structured set of activities required to develop a software system. And that could include specification, design and implementation, validation and evolution, which we talked about at the last, at the end of the last chapter. And there's lots of ways we can describe how the software process works, right? And we'll, we'll go through some of the ways. Um, the two key pieces or two different pieces are the, what I'd call the waterfall or the plan-driven model versus the agile model. And the plan-driven model, everything's planned and advanced and we measure progress against that plan Whereas the Agile model, planning is done on an incremental basis and uh, we change the plan based on customer feedback. Um, in reality, we, when you actually work in a software company, it's never fully plan driven and it's never fully agile. You have to do a, a little bit of a mix sometimes. And it depends on the company, the customer, and the environment that everything's working in. So here's some uh, names, the waterfall model or the plan driven model, the incremental, the agile model, and then um, integration and configuration. Um, Let's go through. So the waterfall model is like this. We define the requirements. We uh, do the design. We do the implementation and unit testing. We do integration and systems testing. And then we move on to operation and maintenance. Each of those phases is, is identified and pulled out as separate. And as it says down the bottom, the main drawback from the waterfall model is that it, it um, doesn't uh, take care of change very, very nicely. Um, sometimes doing that partitioning between those distinct phases and having a, an abrupt change from uh, specification into design can be problematic. And it's most useful for very large systems, right? Where we've, we've got lots of things happening. Um, and it's, it's uh, whereas the Agile is more about smaller teams and um, planning, the planning based model helps you coordinate across a larger organization. Here's a, uh, an incremental development idea, right? We have the overall goal, the outline description, but then we're doing specification, development, and validation at all, the, all at the same time, or at least um, uh, together. And then we, we spit out an initial version, intermediate versions, and a final version while doing specification, development, and validation all the way through. Um, the key benefit of this is that we can deal with changing customer requirements. Um, and that, that's the, the key piece, it's a customer facing idea. Um, one of the problems is the process isn't really visible. It's, it's hard to, can be hard to, to show how, you, how you're making progress, particularly if there are abrupt changes in requirements. 
Um, another problematic part of doing it this way is that the, the system architecture tends to degrade as you um, do new increments. So one of the key things you need to have in a software team do, working this way is a, a software architect to, to try and keep that system structure in place. And then integration and configuration, this is about um, software reuse and we want to sometimes buy COTS, commercial off the shelf systems and plug and play them together. And there's a lot of um, benefits for doing this, mostly cost, sometimes time, and uh, that reuse is a, is a, a big benefit. Um, you've all probably reused software. You've probably used .NET or Java libraries. You've probably used web services. Um, you may have even used uh, Colts software. Um, so it's, it's not a new thing and it can fit into the other ways of working as well. Right, so here's a, a, a way to think about reuse. We get the requirements, we look for software, we evaluate software, we refine the requirements based on what we've found out about the software, we pull out the, the right components and we um, use those if they're, if they're usable as is, we adapt them if they're not, or if we can't find a component, we develop new ones and then we integrate everything into the overall system. So here's the key processes, the requirement specification, the software discovery, requirements, refinement, application system configuration, and component adaptation and integration. That's for the reuse way of doing things. Um, we can reduce costs. We can maybe deliver faster. Maybe we have to compromise on requirements and we don't have control over the reused system elements. They're some of the negatives, the last two of the negatives. So what do we have to do? Um, there's lots of things we have to do in software, but the four basic things are specification, development, validation, and evolution, which we've talked about. So there's here's a, a little bit deeper dive into requirements. The first thing is requirements, elicitation, and analysis. How do we pull out those, those requirements? Um, then there's requirement specification, writing it down and making sure that we've captured the requirements. Then there's a requirements validation. Um, if we produce a system that meets those requirements, is the customer going to be happy? And here's some more. Right, so this is just talking through those, those three pieces. I'm not going to read. You can read as well as I can. Um, so the next piece is software design and implementation. Right, and we might have platform information, requirement specification and data. That's the inputs. Then we do various things under the design activities umbrella. We do architectural design, interface design, component design, database design. And then at the out of, output of that, we get a system architecture, a database specification, an interface specification, and a comp component specification. And that just talks about the details of those. So then we've got to implement it, and we've got to program it, and we've got to debug it. The verification and validation piece is um, what happens towards the end either of a, a sprint if it's an agile or towards the end of the development if it's a plan-based approach. And verification is does the system meet the requirements written down? And validation is is the customer happy with what we've produced? Okay, so we, um, we can test components pretty easily. We can test the system pretty easily. Acceptance testing can be a little harder 
because we need to involve the customer and they may have specific things that they want to do. And again, um, I'm not going to read what's here. This is just a, a detail of those three types of testing. Okay, so here's a, uh, a look at testing across the plan-driven software process, the VMOL. Right, requirement specification, system specification, system design, detailed design, and then we get to module and unit test code. All right, and then we do subsystem integration, system integration test, acceptance test. Once we've passed all the acceptance tests, we push it into service. What this is saying though, is that that acceptance test plan, the thing that runs the acceptance test, should be able to be written as soon as you've finished the requirements and started the system specification, right? You don't have to wait until the end of design or the end of implementation in order to write that acceptance test plan. So you can do that work up front. So software evolution. We need to change software. Things change. The things that the software talks to change, right? So we need to, to do that and we need to keep, um, uh, we need to define what this, what changes about the system, assess the existing system to make sure it's, it meets or doesn't meet things, propose changes, modify the system and produce the new system. So coping with change, this is the, the key piece about um, software, right? Change is inevitable on all large software projects and change leads to rework so that costs go up um, because of that rework. We need to anticipate change and we need to be tolerant of change, right? The process needs to be able to accommodate change without incurring undue costs on the company. Right, so system prototyping can be useful to quickly check customer requirements to make sure we're heading in the right direction. And then incremental delivery can all with customer feedback can also help with getting customer comments and allowing us to experiment with the customer on things that we're, we're not sure about in terms of the requirements. So a prototype is an initial version of the software used to demonstrate concepts and try out design options. Um, can be a throwaway. Um, you've got to be very careful though um, to make sure that the expectation for all stakeholders is that it's a throwaway if that's the way you're going to do it. What are the benefits? We can get improved usability, we're better matched to user needs, better design, better maintainability, and hopefully reduce design, uh, development effort. Right, so here's a, a, a list of steps we can do for prototyping. What are the objectives? Define the functionality, develop the prototype, and then evaluate the prototype. And then the bottom items are the documentation or the, the artifacts that come out of each of those steps. And again, I'm not going to talk through this. Proto I'm not going to read out the slides rather. Um, prototype development, Throw away prototypes, like I said, you've got to be um, careful because uh, a throwaway is probably not going to pass QA, quality assurance. Um, so you've got to be careful with those. Okay, so incremental delivery. The idea here is we deliver the software a piece at a time. And sometimes that's useful. Sometimes we've got to build up enough of the software for it to be in any way, shape or form helpful for the user. Um, the nice thing about incremental delivery is we grab the biggest bang for buck, the most value for the customer earlier rather than later. And that way the, the customer gets a f better feeling of forward progress. Um, however, once we've started the development on a particular increment, we have to freeze the requirements. One of the biggest problems with a lot of software projects is um, 
uh, changing requirements during development. The key piece about the increment is the requirements are frozen so we can move forward. Um, this is just again about incremental deliver development and delivery. Um, this is the way agile approaches work and it's for a lot of software systems it's a much more usable way of, of delivering things. Okay, so here's a, a, a flowchart showing um, how we go about it. Right. We define the requirements, we assign the requirements to increments, we design the architecture, we develop an increment, we validate the increment, we integrate the increment into the existing system, we validate the new existing system, and we deploy the increment. Then we make a determination whether the uh, requirements are done. If they're done, we have the final system. If they're not, we go through that uh, development system increment loop again. The key part of this for me is a lower risk of overall project failure. Um, that's the, the key part of incremental delivery for me. Um, so the problem is that, as I said, sometimes you've got to build enough of the system for it to be workable. So this is what the first bullet point here is. And the, uh, the second bullet point is that we've got to not have everything specified before we start. And sometimes that, that can go against corporate uh, guidelines for depending on the organisation you're in. If you're doing a process, you want to be able to improve it, right? And this is, in order to improve it, you need to know how well you're doing. So you need to understand the existing processes and you need to measure them and figure out how to improve it. Um, I think we're going to, yeah, so the, the key piece, this is what my kids learnt in kindergarten which is plan, do, review, right? Um, this is measure, analyze, and change. That's what we do in a, in a process improvement. First of all, you've got to measure the process. What, is it hours? Is it dollars? Is it lines of code? What's the measurement? And you analyze how well or otherwise the process is working. And then you propose a change to hopefully improve the measurements that you're making. Um, as it says, it's best to have quantitative numbers. You don't want to use qualitative. Sometimes qualitative reasoning can be uh, uh, easily manipulated. And the, those measurements should be used to improve, uh, to assess the, whether the, the thing you're doing, the change you made, is an improvement. Um, the time taken is one, the resources required is another, the number of occurrences, number of defects, for example. So the, uh, they didn't actually talk about it, this is on the next slide. Um, the Software Engineering Institute at the Carnegie Mellon uh, University has these levels of uh, capability maturity, right? So how well can you do something? Level one is initial. Level two is managed, level three is defined, level four is quantitatively managed, and level five is optimizing. Initial is, we don't know what we're doing, or we just do whatever makes sense, right? Um, the next one is repeatable, so we need to write down procedures about how we do stuff. Next is defined. Um, Uh, so the process management procedures and strategies are, are defined and used. Then we manage them. So we, we measure the way we're managing the process and we use those measurements to manage the process. And then we're optimizing at the highest level. Um, we drive those numbers to a better, a better value. 
and uh, I don't think we go through it in this course but uh, I do talk about it a little bit in um, uh, software project management the, there's a lot of process areas that uh, the software engineering institute defines I might see if I can find a, a, a slide about that okay so the key point software process for this chapter software processes are activities that we do in order to produce a system um, requirements engineering is uh, the piece up front that we do to develop the spec. There's design and implementation, there's validation, there's evolution, our other steps in, when we make software. And the processes include ac activities such as prototyping and incremental delivery. Um, processes can be structured for iterative development. They don't have to be done via plan. Um, the principal approaches to process improvement are agile approaches um, and the Software Engineering Institute process maturity framework identifies maturity levels that essentially uh, correspond to the use of good software engineering practice. And I'll, I'll see if I can find the uh, a slide about that one. Okay, that is chapter two.